Thank you for your patience and thank you for attending this webinar on ethics in plant science hosted by the Global Plant Council. Uh, for the webinar today, we are lucky to have Professor John Bryan with us. Professor um, um, John Bryan obtained his PhD in plant biochemistry at the University of Cambridge in 1968. He has a long career that includes being a past president president of the Society for Experimental Biology and a former advisor on bioethics to the UK's Higher Education Academy. He is currently Professor Emeritus of Cell and Molecular Biology in the School of Bioscience at the University of Exeter and a research associate in the Center for Genomics in Society, also at the University of Exeter. So John, thank you so much for being here today and the floor is yours. Thank you so much, uh, Isabel, which is gracias for your introduction. So let's uh, get on. I hope everybody can see that, no problems. So bioethics uh, and plant science. Um, it turned out to be quite a difficult topic to address. Um, because it's something that I haven't thought about deeply, although I've thought a lot about bioethics, it's not been very much in relation to the plant science. So it gave me the opportunity to have some more deep thought about that. Uh -huh, it's not moving, what's happening here? Yeah. Oh, there we go. So ethics uh, and, and bioethics. Um, a quick definition here. Ethics is really about how do we make decisions about what is morally right or good and what is morally wrong or bad how do we decide whether this is okay uh, and that's not okay uh, and of course we'll all have our own views about what is okay and what isn't okay but uh, ethics is about making those decisions and then i suppose then bioethics becomes the the application of ethics decision moral decision making to medical and biological science and i'll say a little bit more about that later the the key thing i want to to us to get to take home is that we're thinking about making moral decisions in the area of biological and medical science and that's what we're going to be developing but i first want to explore and those of you who've done some philosophy will know quite a lot about this already but if you haven't this is going to be a kind of useful summary is how do we make ethical decisions decisions about what is right and wrong because that will have um, that will have relevance as we think about bioethics later. Uh, and so we, we, might, we might have, if you like, what I would call a tight system. We might have rules and laws. So this is always wrong and this is always right. Uh, we call that deontology. It comes from the Greek word for duty, deon. Um, uh, and basically Kant is the most famous proponent of that view that there are he called them imperatives, rules that determine our moral behavior. Uh, and so some things were always wrong and some things were always right. Uh, he believed, for example, that it was always wrong to tell a lie. Uh, and then since uh, Kant's time, uh, we've got a sort of subdivision of that rules, which is called rights and duties. And so it's, I have a right to life, that's my right, but I also have a, a duty to protect your right to life. So they kind of go together. But again, these are regarded as absolutes. My right is absolute and my duty to you to protect your right is absolute. So that's rules and laws. The second big group of, of methods is, let's ask what happens if, if I do this, what, how will it turn out? If I do that, how will it turn out? It's called consequentialism because we're thinking about the consequences of a decision uh, and in Britain John Stuart Mill and Jeremy Bentham are the most famous proponents of consequentialism uh, and indeed um, Bentham went further and said actually you, the right decision is the one that makes the most people happy or the most people satisfied so what happens if I do this how many people will be happy how many people will be satisfied? I call that political ethics because they're very keen to keep the population happy. So that's called utilitarianism. Uh, but at the other end of that spectrum, we've got rational egoism where 
the consequences for me are um, the determining factor. What is the right decision for me? Nobody else needs to be worried. Uh, and I ne don't need to worry about anybody else. So that's the second big group of decision-making processes. Consequentialism, what happens if? And then the last group are, are called virtue ethics. What is a virtuous course of action? And by virtue, we mean exercising things like wisdom and charity and compassion and empathy. All those things are virtues. And Aristotle believed that good decisions were made by people exercising those virtues. And that's been taken up subsequent to the Greeks by people like Aquinas, uh, and then more recently in the 20th century by Alistair McIntyre. Uh, and virtue ethics is having a little bit of a revival right now. Now, I'm sure you can see that actually we can, we can, we can pick holes, we can criticize all of these methods because sometimes it's right to break a rule because the outcome, if we obeyed the rule, would not be morally right. Uh, consequentialism, particularly utilitarianism, may ignore the rights of a small group of people if it's the majority we're trying to, trying to please. And, and it, virtue is a little bit vague, trying to say what is the virtuous thing to do here. So they've each got their problems. Now, moving slightly into the area of biology, um, what about animals? What I've been talking about so far is generally regarded as, as, as the way that we behave in relation to each other within human society. That's generally speaking uh, the application of these, but uh, uh, do animals join in with um, th that process? And indeed, uh, going right back to before the common era, maybe as long ago as 3000 years, um, there was some uh, kindness exhibited to working animals, the animals that did work for people. Uh, and coming right up to Jeremy Bentham, Jeremy Bentham believed that animals should be given the same ethical consideration as humans. Which animals we're not sure, perhaps pets and working animals, but animals in general. So that's one thing on animals. And, and the second thing I want to say in relation to all three of these, um, these ethical systems is we need to we need to think about, are we talking about the community as a whole, or are we talking about individuals? So communitarianism would mean that we have, a, we have, um, we have an, ethical, uh, um, an ethical view of thinking about the whole community rather than me as an individual. So those are the kind of ways that ethical decisions have been made over the centuries coming right up to the 21st century. But my question is, can we relate any of this to plant science? Are there rules and laws we should apply? Or do we always think about the consequences? Or do we think more about, is it wise? Is it caring? Is it compassionate? Can we relate any of those methods of making decisions to plant science. So I'm going to give you a, a pause here to think about that. And um, if you want to make any comments uh, in relation to that question, then please feel free to put them in the chat or into the Q&A box, uh, which was sitting across the bottom of my screen earlier. So can we relate any of those ethical decision-making processes to plant science, the subject we're all interested in? So just, just a minute to think about that. Of course, if, the, if this was in person, I'd be able to hear people talking to each other, but sadly we can't do that when we're online. But I hope people are, are thinking about that. Okay, so that's a bit of a pause for thought. Well, one thing that strikes me straight away is that research ethics um, will embody a number of those principles I've talked about that you know there are rules in research that it is an absolute law in research that we don't tell a lie about our results we don't make them up we don't fabricate so that will be an example of um an example of of deontology in research uh, we can think about consequences in research 
uh, what happens if I exclude this person from uh, being an author on this paper? There are consequences for them and for me and so on. So what is the wise thing to do? So uh, there's a whole, there are whole books on research ethics and indeed here at Exeter, part of general postgraduate training uh, is to have uh, a two-hour seminar on research ethics, a participatory seminar. So we can relate those ethical decision-making processes, deontology, consequentialism and virtue, we can relate them to the pursuit of research itself. And you can all come up, I'm sure, with uh, areas where you can identify ethical problems. But we want to think a little bit more about um, plant science itself, rather than just general research. And so we now move on then to think about bioethics and, and how that has arisen in its current form. And we can recognize actually three streams of, of bioethics. The first is medical. Uh, and indeed, if before about the year 2000, you had picked up an American book entitled Bioethics, it would have almost certainly focused almost entirely on um, medical ethics. Not the same in Europe but in America. Uh, and there have been two great um, uh, medical, um, medical developments or, or, or medical events that have uh, spurred on our bioethical thinking in medicine. One was the Nuremberg trials when the, the, the terrible work of, of Dr. Joseph Mengele came to light. And that set up a whole series of ethical principles for when we're working with human patients as uh, in experiments. And so we now have for um, human experimentation, we now got the Helsinki Agreement, uh, which, which governs that. So that was one spur. And then back in the, uh, in the early 70s, the arrival of transplant surgery raised a whole lot of other ethical issues, you know, what defined uh, death in the donor and so on. So, so bioethics got a kind of kick from those two events over in the medical corner. But then uh, we've got environment and environmental ethics is included certainly in my thinking about bioethics. It's not, not included in everybody's, but in my thinking about bioethics, environment fe features very strongly. Uh, and I can identify really two key events here. One was the publication of a book by Rachel Carson, which became kind of a seminal environmental call for help. Um, it's called Silent Spring. Uh, and it was published in the early 60s. And I still have a copy of the first edition sitting uh, just behind me on my bookshelf. But uh, in 1971, a cancer doctor called Van Rensselaer Potter coined the term bioethics with the statement that because of the degradation of the environment, such as had been highlighted by Rachel Carson, because of that, we needed a whole new ethical framework for the for the environment and he called it bioethics and it actually is the first use of the term uh, although we've talked about medical ethics as being a spur to bioethics the first use of the term was by this cancer doctor and Rensselaer Potter recognizing environmental degradation as outlined by Rachel Carson and so we had a new stream of of bioethical thinking and then we had a huge burst of bioethical thinking with the advent of, of biotechnology, modern biotechnology. I don't, mean, I don't mean brewing and bread making, but modern biotechnology, including genetic modification. And that led to a whole new uh, range of, of things to think about. What, was it risky? What should we do with GM? What should be allowed and what shouldn't? Uh, and what we see there with, within all these three areas, we see that that different ethical systems are appropriate for different issues. It is right sometimes we say, this is against the law, it should never be done. It is also right to say, what happens if I do this? Is that better than if I do that? That's okay, consequentialism. And it's also okay to say for other applications, and this may be particularly true of plant science, it may, what is the wise or virtuous thing to do here? Is this a wise or virtuous use of our science? So GM and biotechnology became, if you like, the spur to what I call the modern, the modern increase in bi bioethical thinking. Uh, and it's certainly been the basis of what has been behind lots of university courses uh, in the late 20th and early 
21st century. And, and so quickly thinking a little bit about GM, because it will come up, it will come up again in a moment. Um, the dates. So the first uh, GM bacteria were reported in the press in 1973. The first animal cells were in the early 80s. The first whole animals a little bit later, but certainly um, genetically modified uh, sheep were around by the mid 80s, for example, and mice. Uh, the first successful plant applications, uh, both um, in Belgium and in the United States, 1983, uh, and the first plants to be sown out in the field uh, were in 1985. But the first product of GM for the market was as early as 1977, the human insulin gene. Uh, and and I, I like to, to tell people who've got, um, who've been recently diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, that, you know, they are uh, the proud possessors of, of a prescription for the first product of bacterial genetic engineering. Um, so the, the insulin comes not from the slaughterhouse and pig's pancreases, but from large fermenters in, in uh, pharmaceutical companies. And so here we have a kind of summary of the streams that have led to our current thinking about bioethics. And uh, as we follow that middle stream down, almost every new development raises things that we need to talk about ethically. But also over here on the left, we can see that actually biotechnology links with medical ethics. And so genetic modification, genome editing, can be linked with medical ethics in relation to use on patients, but it also links to the environment because we think, need to think about, is it okay to put these crops out into the fields and so on? And so there's a linkage between both medical ethics on one hand and environment on the other, both being fed into from the biotechnology stream in the middle. Is that okay? Oh, that's okay. So, I, this is a shameless plug for my uh, most recent book, but we discuss uh, in that book the development of those three streams and how how um, bioethics relates to medicine, to biotechnology and to the environment. Um, some bioethics books don't contain environmental ethics, but we certainly contain it in there. So you can rush out and buy one of those. <laughs> OK, so I want to, to look at the interaction um, between biotechnology uh, and plant science, in particular, uh, thinking about um, genetically modified crops. Um, I, it, was, it was really quite interesting. To, when I think back to the early stages of my career, uh, and I can remember discussing with another, uh, we were both very new in the job, another, another plant science academic. Uh, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could isolate individual genes uh, and study how they were controlled, study their structure, study their, um, the way they're expressed. Uh, and of course, the arrival of genetic modification actually enabled us to do that, that it enabled a, a huge um, increase uh, in um, research on plant genes uh, and for which we remain very grateful and much of much of my more recent research has, has relied to quite a large extent on the ability to study individual genes. But of course, the, the genetic modification technique, having been applied to whole plants, meant that we could now um, shortcut some of the long-winded aspects of plant breeding. It takes quite a long time to cross one cultivar with another to isolate an individual trait and then successive years of back crossing. And so it, it very much shortcut the, the long process of generating crops with particular traits. Uh, and again, uh, in, in the um, plant science community, this was to be welcomed. Uh, and yet the uh, advent of GM crops caused a huge campaign from environmental campaign groups. Uh, we were quite surprised about it, actually. I think I think none of us who were kind of more based in the lab, like myself and many colleagues, we really uh, did not expect this to happen. We thought that people would be very pleased that um, th that 
a crop improvement could be now so ready. So it was very surprising. Uh, and, and it was very widespread. Um, it was right across in the United Kingdom, right across the United Kingdom, uh, right across the European Union. Uh, and uh, to some extent, lesser extent then than maybe now uh, in um, Australia uh, and in um, Canada uh, and uh, in the United, uh, United States of America. So widespread, coordinated, vocal, and sometimes a, a very, very aggressive um, campaign. Um, I, I, I don't suppose there's anybody else here who has been called the Antichrist, as I have, in a debate in my own university, a public debate in the evening, I was called the Antichrist because I was supporting the use of genetic modification in plant breeding. That's really quite an accusation, actually, when you think about it. But as I say, some of the opposition was very aggressive. And what then happened was that um, it almost became the, the uh, correct thing to oppose GM crops if you were of the liberal thinking person reading the left-leaning um, newspapers and indeed reading the, the right-leaning leaning newspapers. And so um, the campaigns including ripping up trials of GM crops uh, and, and although that is criminal damage, people who are doing it were found not guilty by juries in courts. And so as I say, it spread very far that in some ways, you know, these things were were not to be used ever, ever. Uh, and that opposition focused on a number of things, that, that these were dangerous to consumers, you know, that we would be eating foreign genes uh, that hadn't been eaten before, that um, they would uh, they were a danger to biodiversity because um, there'd be a focus on just a single genotype. Uh, and indeed, maybe the transferred genes would spread to wild relatives. Uh, and uh, to the environment in general. And so those three areas were very much the focus of the crops. Now, clearly we're talking about bioethics here. We're definitely talking about bioethics. If, if, if the opposition are saying that this is wrong because we will harm people, we will harm the environment uh, and we will harm nature in general. So those are, those are bioethical issues. And I can tell you from the number of debates I had with campaigners that no amount of evidence would convince any of them. Uh, and it, this is a big shock and it, it helped, it got me thinking more deeply about, about bioethical issues. And it was, I think, part of the reason why so many university biology departments then started teaching bioethics. But it's really very much uh, a campaign, although they were, probably wouldn't have called it bioethics, that is, has got bioethical implications. So I hope you don't mind me talking about that in some, some length, because it's been very much part of my life. Okay, so in our view that appropriately used, and I do mean appropriately used, we use these technologies wisely, they're going to be very beneficial to, um, to, to plant science in general, in research, and also to ag agriculture and horticulture. But nevertheless, there were some ethical issues that we need to think about. The first is that, that genes were being patented or, or gene structures being patented. Uh, and um, I was quite surprised when the first patent was granted on the gene. It actually wasn't the plant gene, it was for the human breast cancer one gene, but it, the same principles applied. But uh, in, in general, in the past, that genes were regarded as products of nature and therefore could not be patented. But the argument of the companies who were patenting the genes was that they were patenting cDNA copies, copies of the gene made from by copying the messenger RNA. And uh, so the genes could be patented. So that seemed to me to be a genuine ethical issue because uh, it makes it more difficult for people to use the, the genetic constructs. And then some aspects of the commercialization of the technology were uh, certainly very aggressive uh, in terms of the licensing to, to, uh, to use the crops by farmers and so on. So some aspects of the commercialization were seemed to me to, to lack um, what I would call empathy uh, and 
uh, sharing and so on. And then the last thing, this is the thing that uh, is going to concern us a little bit later in the talk. Um, there is very poor availability uh, of the technology to low and middle income countries. Low and middle income countries maybe are those that actually most need the technology because uh, of their, their um, poverty situation, the need to grow more crops and so on. But it was, became very difficult to get the technology to them because of the gene patenting and the uh, way that the commercialization and license licenses work. So again, there, those, are, those are ethical issues relating to use of this new technology and relating to our science per se. So, Having dealt with that, I've got, I've, I'm going to give you, I'm going to give you five minutes to think about this and put your, put your answers up in the chat. So are there areas of plant science research that are ethically questionable, that we're concerned about them, that we maybe shouldn't do? That's research. Are there areas of research that are, that are worrying us ethically? And then are there uses or applications of research that we are worried about ethically? So just have a think about that. And again, that's something we can talk about later in the question and answer. So are there areas of plant science research that you personally worry about in terms of right and wrong? And are there the applications equally that you worry about in terms of right and wrong? We just have a few minutes to think about that. So, okay, let's, let's have a recap to where we've got to so far. Uh, we've looked at ways that ethical and moral decisions are made. Uh, we've tried to relate those to science in general, maybe through thinking about research ethics. We've looked at the various threads uh, of um, science that have led to the uh, increase in bioethical thinking, particularly uh, in the end of the 20th century and the early part of this century. Uh, we've seen how they're linked with biotechnology feeding out into, into medicine, for example. 
uh, and biotechnology feeding out into environmental research. So we've 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 looked at, at that, and then I'm asking you to think about uh, possible applications that you're familiar with. But let's let's move on. So here we are, 2022. Um, biotechnology is now uh, very well uh, established. If we go back to the um, the GM crop scenario, although there is still opposition. Uh, and and uh, the United uh, the the European Union uh, still only allows a small number of GM crops to be grown. Nevertheless, the GM crops are grown extensively across the world. I think 27 different countries, uh, with the majority of them lower middle lower and middle income countries. So, if you like, biotech crops are spreading across the world uh, and are in some senses embedded in world agriculture even if uh, not in several European countries. So that has been, uh, for us who work in labs, the, as I said earlier, the advent of GM has, has really spurred on our um, understanding of plant genetics and so on. But what now should we be focusing our efforts on? And here, we, we sometimes think of, of um, ethics as saying this is wrong and this is wrong and this is wrong but I would also put it to particularly if we work on a virtue ethics system uh, then we can also say what would be the right the wise the best thing to do here are there ethical imperatives that make us do stuff should a course of action be taken because it is the right thing to do right now so where now for plant science research across the world? Are there ethical imperatives that focus on particular areas of research? Just a question to think about. So plants and climate. Um, the, the climate, the climate crisis uh, is, is ever with us and gets worse by the week almost. Uh, and, and here's a couple of, of plant science based um, topics that are associated with that. And so people have talked extensively about, about biofuels and indeed I and my colleague John Love have published a book about biofuels. They may be a good, a good replacement for, for fossil fuels, but we do need to be realistic. And I, can, we, can we afford enough land to make biofuels a proposition on a large scale? And so this is, these are the data from the UK. If we used all the UK's current agricultural land and put it down to oil sea rig or canola, uh, if you prefer, uh, brassica napus, it would give us about 15% of the annual use of petrol and diesel. So no other crops at all, but just oil seed rape, 15%. So you can see that although biofuels may make a contribution to us approaching net zero, um, it's only going to be a relatively small contribution. And remember, we need to carry on growing food. So there's one, one uh, pause for thought. And here's another one that you know, everywhere, everywhere I go in Britain, there are tree planting schemes. And indeed, I've just, I've just, uh, uh, just bought my daughter-in-law's birthday present. She wanted, she wanted me to plant some trees on her behalf. So uh, obviously trees photosynthesize and they lock up carbon dioxide for many years. But even if we covered the whole world with trees, we would only remove a small proportion of the excess carbon dioxide. The reason for that is that you know, a tree may last 50, 60, 100 years, but we are burning millions of years worth of photosynthesis in fossil fuels. And so one generation covering the world in trees uh, won't do the trick either. So yeah, carry on planting trees, that's good. But uh, again, let's let's remember that it's only a, a tiny contribution. There are other things we might need to do in respect of the climate crisis. And I think plants and climate are going to be very much a theme for us in bioethics over the next few years. And here's another one. So biofuels, as I said, well, they are, they, they might well be good in some cases, but have a look at the, these are fields that are being planted with, with sugarcane by this company, ADAX Bioenergy. Uh, 
But what they've done is they've removed tropical forests in order to plant them, uh, thereby actually increasing the carbon dioxide uh, or, or lessening the carbon dioxide trap that the tropical forests um, maintain. And so one good thing is outweighed by one bad thing. So sometimes, again, we need, we need wisdom in applying our science to the, cri the climate crisis. And also we need to remember that, that it's not just burning fossil fuels that um, contribute to the climate crisis. It's also the way we use the environment as this case illustrates. And just this week, uh, in nature, climate change. This one comes from the climate change group in our physical geographer department. Um, professor Tim Lenton uh, is the professor of, of global uh, atmospheric systems, but actually I call him the professor of climate change. Very, very fine scientist. And so pronounced loss of Amazon rainforest resilience since the early 2000s. In other words, the Amazon rainforest is less able to cope with climatic variation. It's less able to mop up carbon simply because so much of it has been cleared. And there's a real danger that the Amazon rainforest, much of it will turn to savanna, which is not nearly such a biodiverse uh, environment and is also uh, much less able to mop up carbon dioxide. So the way that humans have used the Amazon is making it uh, less uh, less of a, uh, a source of biodiversity and, and less a good sink. So again, human activity. Uh, and then again, this is a, a major bioethical issue. So I want to focus for just the last few moments on food and climate, because food and plants are uh, intimately linked. And here our question, this is a question uh, posed in an article in the the, the a national newspaper in Britain just last week. How will we feed 9 billion people, that's nine times 10 to the nine, nine billion people, without making climate change worse? How will we do that? And it's a real question. The, the world population at the moment is 7.9 billion uh, and is creeping towards the nine billion mark quite fast. People need to be fed. And then this was um, a former scientific advisor to the UK government uh, some years ago. He said, we are facing a perfect storm. We need to feed more people using less land, less land for at least two reasons. One, because people need to be housed and also because rising sea levels. Fewer agricultural inputs because we need to cut down uh, the use of oil-based uh, fertilizers uh, and pesticides for um, environmental reasons, all in the face of a changing climate. It's a perfect storm. What, what do we do? So plant science, I think, has got, has got maybe not some answers, but can contribute to the debate. So these data come from last year and the year before. 800 million people are malnourished. It's better, better than it was 20 years ago, but it's still bad. About 9 million people died from malnutrition, hunger, basically, in 2020, about 9 million. And poverty is one of the main drivers, because the, it's quite literally true. That there are countries that export food where some of their own population can't afford to buy it. And so food needs to be more readily and cheaply available. And that's a key, that's a political thing. But we can, we can make a noise as plant scientists, that's ethical. But food production also needs to increase. We need to think about both those issues. And just to put those numbers in perspective, the total deaths from malaria, HIV, TB and flu in 2020, 3.17 million. So just over a third of the total that die from hunger. Of those uh, four at the bottom, HIV, uh, TB, flu and malaria. TB is the biggest killer, counts for about half of that 3.17 million. So there's a medical ethical issue, getting, getting that out to uh, people who need it, the vaccine. Uh, and if we look at COVID, the, the world number of COVID deaths so far is 6 million uh, since the end of 2019. So that's, that's doing pretty well as a virus, it says sadly. 
So let's have a quick look at some of the issues before we wind up. Greenhouse gas emissions per kilogram of food product. It's not a kilogram of protein or a kilogram of uh, or, uh, kilojoules of energy. It's a kilogram of food product. So the topic will be beef. Uh, and the bottom we've got nuts. Um, and, and this is the carbon dioxide output graph. And you can see that beef uh, and lamb and mutton are way up there, uh, whereas the plant-based foods way down the bottom. So here's the thing, that, that if we can grow more plants and eat less meat, that would help in our uh, attempts to um, mitigate climate change. But again, the plant scientists then have a role to play in improving their productivity and improving the quality of the plant crops. In addition to this, which is um, greenhouse gas emissions, we can also talk about land use, where um, a kilogram of, of um, beef protein takes about 10 times as much land to produce as a, a kilogram of, of um, soy protein. So we've got land use and greenhouse gas emissions to think about. And so there may be an ethical imperative to push for more plant-based diets. And that again, places an ethical imperative on the plant scientists to come up with better, stronger, more disease resistant plants. So these are just my priorities. I'm not saying that all plant scientists to rush out and do the same things, but these are some of my priorities. And in a sense, they're my priorities, the ethical imperatives for the funding agencies. You ought to be thinking about funding these things. Uh, and some plant scientists will want to respond to that by getting out there and doing this. And indeed, I think many are. So pests and diseases, the, the background slide here is of rice blast disease, and it comes from my former colleague, uh, Professor Nick Talbot, uh, currently works now in, in Norwich at the John Innes Institute. So pests and diseases, we need to think about their life cycles. And we need to think about how we make our crops more resistant to their attacks. And incidentally, climate change is affecting the distribution of pests and diseases. Uh, I, I, I noted uh, um, in, um, from Australia this morning that the pests are moving south across the Australian continent and similarly they're moving north uh, in the European continent uh, and professor of, of um, molecular pathology here at Exeter Sarah Gurr says that plant, some plant pathogens are moving north at several kilometers a year so it's not just the life cycles we need to understand it's the distribution and whether our crops have resistance to these new, um, these diseases that are newly arrived. Then I think we need to focus on what it is about a plant that increases its productivity. I spent much of my research life looking at the replication of DNA in the context of cell division, and that in turn in the context of plant development, because we wanted to know which processes it was that contributed to the plant body. And I was working way down at the molecular end of that, uh, and in the end might therefore uh, increase productivity. So that's another area that I, I would be one of my ethical priorities. And then we need to think about plant nutrition. Uh, we've, uh, we've talked about uh, agriculture, uh, needing uh, high yielding crops, needing high fertilizer. Uh, we need to think about whether we can mitigate that by finding better ways that plants can use without too much additional help, can, can utilize nutrients from the soil. Uh, and will the long standing goal of a nitrogen fixing cereal plant ever come, to, ever come to fruition? And of course that also implies the way we grow the crops. So we need to think about agronomy. But I think, and then finally, uh, in this area of my priorities, we definitely need to think about Resist, res, resilience to climate change. Uh, and I know that um, uh, Ros Gledar, who is the current president of this council, um, is working on uh, resilience to climate change, not in the crop plant, but uh, as a general principle, how do plants respond to climate change? Because that's going to be absolutely vital. Can our crops continue to produce uh, the goods as the climate changes, as maybe we get to two degrees of, of warming? And finally, 
since uh, Isabel and I are both keen on plant communica science communication, um, good, clear communication, not just publication is vital. I think maybe that was the, uh, that was one of the things that went wrong in the early days of the plant GM debate. So we hadn't really communicated uh, clearly enough to the outside public exactly what this technology was. So good, clear communication, uh, being truthful, uh, being open. Also, these are ethical principles is vital. But also technology transfer. You need to be thinking about what is the best way to ensure that, for example, low and middle income countries can use the technology that we plant scientists are developing in our labs. And so it's not just about the science itself. It's also about the way we present it and the way that it is used. And so with that, I will stop and be very happy to have questions and discussion. So thank you for listening. Thank you, John. So I'm going- Can I stop? Shall I stop sharing the screen here? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, because I'm also going to reclaim the rights. <laughs> there we go. Perfecto. <laughs> okay. Um, so, uh, the floor is open for questions. Oh, okay. I think uh, there is, yeah, there is already one one uh, question. May we take the presentation? Um, okay, John, would you be willing to share the presentation later on? Yeah, yeah. The presentation will be so the whole webinar will be available on YouTube probably tomorrow. So it will depend on my workload, but it and will be it will be there. And I will email the uh, whole presentation to you, Isabel, so that mm -hmm. if anybody wants the slides themselves, they may have them. Mm -hmm. Okay. So uh, next, maybe uh, if you agree, we could we could discuss uh, what was uh, suggested before in the chat on the applications and areas of plant science that could be uh, regarded as problematic from an ethical point of view. Mm -hmm. So there is a first comment from Petra Yorash. Here she writes, uh, application, developing plants that could harm other organisms, including humans or plants that are invasive. So using plants as weapons. Yes. In the end. I think that's a, that's a very good point. And it's something that had crossed my mind. Uh, and I hoped that uh, it would come up in the discussion. But that is something that I think... Um, as we m learn more about plant environment interactions uh, or gene environment interactions, that is certainly a feasible possibility. And it's something that I think is unacceptable. Yeah, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Petra. So next there is, uh, there was one intervention that was mine. Uh, I think you have already commented on that uh, during the presentation that it was land use for non-food crops. When yeah. we, you're talking about biofuel and how it could help on some on some degree with uh, um, decarbonizing, but at the same time, it's not it's not a, it's not the key. It's not the answer to the problem. Right. So next, uh, we have a comment from Gerard uh, Parry. So uh, and he comments, release of resistant genes into the environment when there are the small chance that they will be transferred to wild populations. Yeah, I think this is, this is very important. I think we need to know about the ecology of the re regions that we are working in to know whether um, wild relatives are possible uh, impossible receipt of genes through cross-pollination. So we do need to know a little bit more about the areas in which we are, are working um, before we uh, just go. And I noticed, for example, that the, the Chinese scientists have been very careful about, uh, about, about rice and weedy rice, which is a wild rice, to um, ensure that um, there are gaps uh, that uh, where wind pollination won't carry 
pollen to the weedy rice. So that's a very, a very good point indeed. That resistance could be disastrous if it got into uh, a noxious weed that was a relative of a crop. Mm -hmm. It's theoretical, but it's possible. It is possible. Um, so next we have another comment from Petra. Uh, Terminator technology that prevents self-replication via seeds. This was discussed in the 90s. So the termi Terminator technology itself as, as the source of uh, an ethical problem. This was, this was very strange. Um, the, the, the campaigners against GM were forever worried that the genes would, inverted commas, escape or that the genetically modified crop would in some way dominate the environment. Um, uh, and, and so um, the Terminator technology was developed by, well, not just one company, but by several uh, labs to say, okay, if you're worried about them spreading, um, if you're worried about them gaining a foothold in the environment, let's make it impossible for the seeds to terminate. So Terminator technology was actually developed in response to the campaigners. But in the end, it was never ever employed commercially ever. The, the World Bank refused to uh, fund any uh, research project which involved terminated technology in actual crops. And so it never ever went to market, but it is there. Um, quite, you know, whether it's ever useful in a lab, a lab scenario, I don't know. Um, the technology is there, but it's never been used uh, in commercial products. Oh, I didn't know that because mm -hmm. uh, you heard so much about the Terminator technology. Oh, we did. That you, we did. Yeah. Well, you, I, I was assuming that it was in use. Mm. Okay. So next we have a, a comment from Jorge. Contrary to animals and human research, plant research don't pose ethical problems because plants usually are not considered ethical subjects. Mm -hmm. So plants as the subject of the of the ethics, I would say, this is the comment. Yeah, that's, I find that it's, that's a very interesting comment. And it was one, one thing that kept coming through my head, you know, that we focus our ethical frameworks on, on humans or on animals. But if, it, 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 what do we think about the environment itself? Mm -hmm. And that's something we discuss uh, in the book that I showed. What do we think about, does, does it have an ethical, uh, an ethical standing, ethical status? Um, simply because it is there. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, in one Latin American country and in Australia, uh, both those countries, an ecosystem has been granted rights as if it was, of course, it can't, it can't, hasn't got any corresponding duties, which is the, the difficulty. But, but how, do we, how do we regard components of the environment? Are, are they to be respected just because they're there? Or do we do we do we do we, as it were, respect them because of the use that they give us, you know, crops? So it's a it's a very interesting question, uh, and I can see exactly where the, the comment is coming from. But other people think know that plants do have an ethical standing, mm -hmm. simply because they are part of the environment. I think that also this comment connects with this uh, plant blindness uh, yes, that yes. That typically. Uh, um, the, the plant scientists complain uh, because uh, apparently uh, people, when they go into their environment, they don't regard plants as, as living beings in the end. And, we, and, and you and I don't need to be told, we should tell the world that without plants, we would not be here. Yeah, certainly. And, and the, the famous um, nature program broadcaster, Sir David Attenborough, don't know if you've heard of David Attenborough? He's, he's a very yes. big um, nature communicator has recently launched a series on the green planet. Mm -hmm. uh, and I thought about time too, you know, we needed this, but he, he made the same point that without plants, we would not be here. Uh, and I noticed this in the literature, there's quite a lot about plant blindness now. I, I reviewed mm -hmm. a paper the other day about plant blindness. Mm -hmm. So we, we, must, we must take people's blindness away. <clears throat> yeah, it's, it's really a, a hot topic right now. At least among plant scientists, I would say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so there is another comment by Petra. 
Um, it can also be ethically questionable to prevent using beneficial applications of a technology. I think she's referring to GMs. To prevent? Yeah, to prevent using beneficial applications of the yeah. technology. Well, indeed, um, you know, I'm, I'm associated with the genetic literacy product, which is project which is based in Canada. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they've been arguing now for 10 years that the campaigning against GM is unethical. Mm -hmm. because it's preventing uh, increased food production uh, and increased ability to produce high quality crops. Uh, and um, I think one of the sad things for me was that because of the, the campaigning in Europe, uh, many less developed countries thought that these, these crops were dangerous and actually initially rejected them. Zambia is the classic example. But mm -hmm. now uh, just, just following um, the um, genetic literacy product, I, I see that at last that, that barrier is being got over. But I think my own view is that if there's a very, very positive, helpful, good application of the technology, then it is not ethical to campaign against it. We can be that strong, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, uh, uh, that's totally true. Um, I completely agree, and I, I've been thinking it for a while. Not, I, I don't personally. I don't think about ethics a lot. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, I, I was. Uh, I, I, I remember thinking that it was not, uh, uh, not clever. I didn't go as far as going not ethical, but it was not clever. What the the policy that is uh, being applied yeah. here in Europe? Yeah. Uh, do you think that it's going to change in the UK now with the Brexit? Well, I don't know. I mean, Brexit is a disaster. I'm, I'm going to be quite big. Brexit is a disaster in the United Kingdom. Absolutely disaster. But I, I think that might be the one good thing that comes out of it is that we have got, we, we are not bound by the European Commission's recommendations on GM and genome editing. So there has been a very slight change in, in attitude already. And I think that's, that's coming along. But but it's that's a very very big price to pay for breath, but the, everything we've lost. <laughs> I understand. Yes. So we have another comment from Petra. Oh, she's very chatty. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Love you, Petra. Please come <laughs> back. So uh, you mentioned technology transfer and access for developing countries as ethical. I think this was uh, an aspect that was recognized with when Golden Rice was developed, including yes. access to patents. But yes. the NGOs claim that we want uh, that we want to use people in the developing countries as guinea pigs for GM, GMO technology. So you can always turn things around. Yes. I know. I know. That was the, all sorts of misinformation was being used by the campaigners, and that was one of them. I mean, the fact that it had been extensively trialed. Um, uh, under very strict conditions, both agronomically and nutritionally in the Philippines um, before it was finally released. It shows that, that that was wrong. Yeah, it was finally released just a couple of months ago. Yeah, yeah, Ev eventually. 1999, I think, was, was when it was when, when it was first developed by mm -hmm. Inga Patricus. So it's, it's over 20 years. Yeah, well over 20 years. That's true. And that's sad. Very sad. Yeah. So uh, we are we are over time, two minutes over time. We have another, Jorge, also. Uh, we may succeed in convincing people who is against GMOs for consequentialist reasons, but hardly those who are intrinsically against for religious reasons or quasi-religious reasons. That's right, you see, and he, he makes that very good point that consequentialism mm -hmm. here, uh, and combined, I think, with virtue, comes up against deontology, rights and laws. Although I don't know anybody, you know, I'm, I'm actually a Christian, uh, a Christian, but I don't know anybody, religious person, who opposes GM crops on religious grounds. I, I can't think of anybody. Mm -hmm. um, well, uh, regarding religion, I don't think, I don't know if that's, uh... I remember, I remember because I was working with uh, uh, transgenic plants when I was doing the PhD. 
and and my mom is quite religious so i remember the 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 catholic church released like the the new capital scenes of the modern era and among those there was working with transgenics oh my goodness i don't remember that <laughs> that happened that happened oh my goodness <laughs> I think Pope Francis is rather more well informed. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. It, that was more well over ten years ago, fifteen yeah. years ago, something like that. And it was, uh, they were some interesting uh, dinner table chats. <laughs> I would say so, somebody raised the precautionary principle just there in the chat, and I think yes. it's important. But the trouble is that the version of the precautionary principle that the campaigners wanted to apply was so fierce that you would have never ever done anything new ever mm -hmm. because you know even if there's no proof of harm you shouldn't do it mm -hmm. and what that means you should you shouldn't carry out new forms of medicine new forms of technology uh, it's it's a form of the precautionary principle we just can't work with <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a way of stopping innovation altogether. Absolutely, totally, totally. So I'm just checking if uh, new comments come in. These are nice comments. I've liked them very much. Yeah. 